So, okay, my name is Fabio Sanchez. Um, I'm the Quantum Computing Services Lead for QCWare. Um, and then let me, uh, I'll, I'll introduce QCWare and then I'll pass it over to both Natalie and Sean to introduce themselves. Um, but, uh, so QCWare is a quantum computing uh, software company. That means we really don't produce hardware. We're, you know, we're just, we're just focused on producing software. And specifically, you know, what, what we do uh, right now is we we engage with customers uh, uh, to to kind of uh, design algorithms for them uh, through our professional services, um, and then that will uh, naturally kind of feed into the software that we make. And the software that we make is called Forge. That's what I'm going to be uh, talking about today. And then in addition to that, we kind of just uh, you know do research on quantum algorithms to deliver better performance. So uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to Natalie first, introduce herself, and then Sean. Uh, hi, I'm Natalie. Uh, I'm a quantum engineer at QCWare. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Sean Weinberg. I'm also a quantum engineer at QCWare. Um, at QCWare, I basically work on um, uh, research on quantum algorithms. Um, I work on software engineering for our um, platform, Forge, um, and I work on professional services with um, various corporate customers. Um, and um, as a side note, my background is kind of in uh, theoretical physics. Yeah. Sean and I actually did our PhDs together at Berkeley. Um, all right. Okay. So, so with that being said, let me go ahead and just dive into the platform. Right. So, so like I mentioned, I'm going to talk about Forge and how it delivers performance for our customers. So, Forge is really about algorithms. Um, so, it's it's a software platform, software as a service, actually. And uh, what 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 our main focus is on the platform is is to deliver the best possible algorithms that run on quantum computers. Now, of course, to deliver those algorithms, naturally, uh, we need computers to run them on. Um, and, you know, we, we do provide simulators as well, but uh, it's important to kind of bundle that access, uh, bundle those algorithms with hardware access. And and that that is also part of Forge. So once you go into Forge, you don't have to worry about provisioning, uh, uh, you know, your own accounts to various quantum hardware providers. That comes with the platform as well. But of course, the main focus of the platform is uh, the algorithms. So we've built it with two types of users in mind. Uh, one of those are the expert users. So those are the users that uh, know enough about quantum computers that might want to essentially design and run their own quantum circuits. So uh, the, the functionality that um, that Forge provides for expert users is essentially, you know, basic circuit edit, circuit editing. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll demo that later on. Um, but as well as, uh, in addition to kind of standard simulation tools, we provide GPU accelerated simulation where we provision the GPU for you, as well as we allow you the ability to import circuits directly from Cascade and Circ, right, two popular open source libraries from IBM and Google. So we want to make kind of the experience of using Forge or transitioning to using Forge's simulators as easy as easy as possible. Uh, so the other type of users that Forge is designed for are, are what we call new users to quantum computers. So so we envision that those users don't really uh, want to or or aren't going to be designing their own circuits, but still want to take advantage of the of essentially the performance advantages that quantum computers at least will provide. And for the time being, uh, they can understand uh, how quantum computers can be used. So for those users, we actually provide turnkey algorithm implementations. Um, that, and, and all of those algorithm implementations, often we have kind of bare bones version of those, but uh, what we focus on is essentially pro providing kind of unique algorithms that uh, improve the performance of the standard algorithms. And I'll, I'll discuss more about what I mean uh, in a little bit. And all of that is delivered through essentially hosted Jupyter notebooks that you can that you can use directly on the browser. So this is this is just a snapshot of what it looks like. 
Um, and during the demos, we'll actually see more closely uh, exactly how it works. Um, so let me talk about a little bit about the algorithms we're, we currently offer. And this is uh, not talking about circuit editing, just the kind of turnkey algorithms. So there's two main libraries right now that we address. One of them is binary optimization. And for near-term binary optimization, uh, you may be already familiar that the two uh, kind of quantum algorithms that address it is um, one is quantum annealing that runs on D-Wave, essentially. And the other one is the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, or QAOA, that, run, that runs on circuit model machines. Um, and of course, you know, we have variants of those, as we'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, the other main library that we offer is the quantum machine learning library. And uh, the functionality that we provide there is in classification, regression, and clustering. I'll talk both about those uh, in more detail in a little bit. So I also want to kind of just uh, flash what the what the backends that we have available right now. Like I mentioned, you know, the the, the really only commercial quantum annealer available is D-Wave, so we do offer access to that. Um, for uh, for circuit model hardware, uh, we provide access to IronQ's IronTrap and Rigetti superconducting device through the Amazon Bracket service. Um, and we will soon provide access to um, IBM's devices as well. And then, like I mentioned, you know, we provide standard CPU simulators as well as GPU, um, GPU simulators. So this is the architecture um, of Forge. Uh, I want to just discuss this a little bit. Uh, the, the, the main part is really uh, in the custom algorithms portion. That's where we focus most of our time. And, and like I mentioned, we have two main libraries, binary optimization and machine learning. Uh, here we kind of we have this slide as a roadmap. So we were we have like building Monte Carlo fun functionality on um, on our roadmap. So that will hopefully be released, you know, within the next major release or so. Um, and and this is what we you know focus most of our time on. For each of these libraries, what we do is we perform we 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 offer performance boosts or add-ons. Um, that, that are supposed to uh, improve the performance over the standard quantum algorithm that you would get. Um, for example, if you run directly on T-Wave um, you know, and, don't, and don't have experience setting your parameters properly or setting annual schedules, um, you, know, you might be better off just using uh, our performance add-ons that, that are going to kind of improve the performance over standard T-Wave. And we'll, we'll go into detail a little bit more. So a lot of this, um, a lot of these algorithms are built using some, a, a middleware. We call it Quasar. Um, but the important part here is that by kind of, you know, having this middleware, we can kind of abstract away um, the, the, the software portion of like connecting to the various platforms and hardware providers. So, you know, we, we like I mentioned, we to access hardware, we use uh, Amazon Bracket. We envision also uh, in, uh, using Azure Quantum in the future. And of course, we provide, you know, the, the very bottom layer is, are the, quantum hardware providers that we, we then connect those algorithms to. And finally, sometimes we, we deliver these algorithms directly to customers as, you know, as bare bones algorithm implementations. Sometimes we kind of wrap them into, uh, into more application-based solvers. All right, so now I'm actually going to go into kind of each part of Forge individually, and then I'll call uh, on both Sean and Natalie to uh, perform demos of the functionality that I'm talking about. So let's start with quantum machine learning. So for our quantum machine le learning uh, algorithms, they're all built on uh, on what we call the quantum distance estimation algorithm. And the the distance estimation that we've developed, you know, provide the speed up for uh, in, in the dimensionality of the data. So for large dimensional data, um, it's actually, you know, the, the complexity of performing distance estimation using the quantum algorithm is lower than using the classical algorithm. So in addition to that, um, for quantum machine learning uh, to, to work, we need to actually have the quantum computer have, have access to the classical data and naturally, that requires loading the classical data onto the quantum computer. This is kind of a problem that's been discussed a lot. It's like the QRAM problem. So um, there, you know, there, there's many ways to load 
the data onto the quantum computer. Um, but what we've developed is essentially um, a set of data loaders that are flexible enough that, that, that essentially trade off qubits versus depth, which allows you to essentially um, uh, load load more data on smaller quantum computers. That's that's really that's really where what we're going for here. Of course nothing comes for free, right? So anytime you're kind of trading that off, if you're using fewer qubits, you have to use a, a deeper circuit. But the nice thing about these these loaders is that there's this flexibility provided. So so here I have kind of an example of what I mean. Um, you know naturally this this so you know on the right uh, I would have like a full uh, a, a, like a kind of a standard picture that with 1024 by 1024 pixels, you know, on, on, a, on a small quantum computer of, you know, up to 2000 qubits, that's never going to, we we're never going to be able to load it. Um, but depending, it, depending on the loading technique, you know, it may, it may be difficult to even load a 10 by 10 uh, pixel image um, on, on that quantum computer. But using you know the data loaders we provided, we can kind of uh, adapt things appropriately. And using 1600 qubits, we would be able to load a 40 by 40 pixel image. Uh, so what what we believe that the the effect of that is that we can kind of bring a lot of QML algorithms closer to the near term. Even though machine learning is still uh, not a near term, uh, we don't believe it to be a really a near term quantum algorithm to, that will deliver a speed up over classical. Uh, we, we think that the data loaders are going to uh, help kind of pushing that, pushing that back a little bit. Okay, so now uh, I, I want to, Sean is actually going to give a demo. Uh, what we're going to see is uh, QCWare's uh, functionality and how it compares to scikit-learn's uh, just scikit learns library doing the same thing. So we're going to look at k nearest centroid, k nearest neighbors, and uh, the k means algorithm. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Sean will share his. Uh, you're on mute, I think. Sorry about that. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> So what you're looking at here, if you can see my screen, and let me know if there's any problems with that. Um, this is uh, the software platform that QCWare has built. Um, it's called Forge. Um, and uh, you know this is just our web-hosted uh, platform. Um, now, uh, over here, you see there's various functionalities. You can look at the backends that we have, the way that our API works. and um, where you're really going to do most of your work, unless you download it to your own computer with um, the Python client library, is through our Jupyter Notebook server. And that's what we're looking at here. So if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, this should be fairly familiar to you. Um, if not, just kind of like follow along with the, the key technical points and you can look into Jupyter Notebooks later. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about quantum machine learning in Forge, just, just a tiny demo here. Um, the, the first step is, is you set an API key, which basically proves to Forge who you are. And um, then I generated some, some data points. I just made 40 data points with uh, two features. So it's like, you can think of it as 40 points in, in a two-dimensional plane. Um, and then we're going to do some clustering algorithms. So the first clustering algorithm that I'm running here is a quantum nearest centroid classifier. So the top picture is the result of the quantum nearest centroid classifier. And the bottom picture is a comparison with a uh, classical algorithm doing the same thing. Now, one point of confusion here is that you have to understand that when I say that I'm running a quantum algorithm on Forge, what's happening is that I'm simulating a quantum computer. So I didn't actually send this to a physical quantum machine for this demonstration. It's it's a simulated quantum computer. Let's do this next example. So this is the quantum nearest neighbors classifier. This is another supervised learning experiment. It's very similar to the last one. Now, while it runs, you should know that there's a lot that's happening under the hood. So one of the things that Fabio highlighted is that machine learning works with classical information. You have to give classical data to the machine. Um, uh, 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 to, to, to classify that data. 
Um, so in order to run that on a quantum algorithm, you have to first convert that classical information, just the numbers, into quantum information. So you have to load it into a quantum circuit. So one of the things that we've been working on a lot is how to efficiently load classical data into the circuits. And that's kind of part of the magic that happens behind the scenes. The last example that I just ran is called Q-means. So unlike the other examples, um, this is an unsupervised learning process. So we did not label the data for, for learning here. Um, and in this case, you see that, that again, uh, the, the, the quantum algorithm Q-means returns a very simple, si similar result to a corresponding classical uh, computation. In this case, the classical comparison is the so-called K-means clustering algorithm. Some of you may be uh, familiar with that one already. Um, so the, the, the kind of take home point for this very short demo is just that, you know, <laughs> quantum machine learning sounds pretty uh, esoteric, um, but uh, it's worth remembering that it's still, you know, it, it is something that if you have some background in classical data science with a little bit of help from, for example, this uh, platform, it's not too hard to just do some, you know, simple, examples and and start you know getting your your foot into the door here okay uh, thanks uh back to fabio now hey, thanks uh, yeah yeah this, uh, another I, question question yeah yeah hey uh i don't know maybe this is uh, i'm not sure if it's for you sean or or for you fabio but can you say a little bit about uh the technique that you use for this data loading i'm, I'm assuming that when you say data loading you're talking about taking that classical data set and turning it into some set of gates that's embedded within a quantum circuit. Is that, mm -hmm. is that, am I right so far? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, um, it's, so, so you, you actually may be familiar, you know, with there, there's like, you know, different, there's like different techniques previously or like, how, how do you do that? Right. So, um, one, one can imagine like, Actually, I, 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 it's probably better if I just give give two examples. So you, you can imagine loading the data um, in, in two ways. One of them is uh, kind of in, in in a unary way, where uh, like each uh, like each entry gets mapped. So if you if you think about your quantum register like as a bunch of zeros, then your quantum state is like a superposition. You can imagine that superposition either running over every single state. In the in the Hilbert space associated with that, right? So it, it would be like two to the n entries there, or but but alternatively, one could one could imagine the superposition being you know amplitudes times uh, times states with Hamming distance one, right? So that that's what I would call a unary encoding, right? So it's like like for for like dimensional index one, right? So so the whole point is that like if I if I think about the the register as like the index indexing my data in my in, in an array or something that I'm organizing it then you know index one could be zero 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 one index two instead of being how we traditionally think about a zero 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 uh one zero at the end we just do well in this case it's the same sorry but it the, it, it, it becomes different in, in in three instead of instead of encoding three as like like zero one one you do it as one zero zero right so so as all I'm all I'm not saying anything fancy here. I'm just saying that like you can imagine like encoding the data in a different way, actually, and by doing a unary encoding, to so so remember that the uh, the actual kind of the what the register represents, right? Like the index that 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 represents that represents the kind of the corresponding index in the array, such that like classically, like if you have an array called A, then you know A sub I gives you the data that you want to load, right? And that data gets mapped onto the amplitude of, of a corresponding, uh, of, of, of like the state. And you want to do that in superposition, of course. So, so I, I don't know if this is going down into too much detail right now, but so I, I think I get the fact that you've got two different encodings. I would think of a, one as being an, a one hot encoding. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, binary style encoding. Yeah. So once you say, here's my data set, here's my encoding, it sounds like you still have kind of a, a complicated problem left to solve, which is how do you create the circuit that actually generates yeah. that 
that that encoding. And so I assume you have some technology for that. Yeah, yeah, actually. So, so you kind of have to, at that point, you kind of have to work out just like exactly what what circuit produces that that the the data and and you can show that the reason I brought up these two is that for the one hot encoding essentially the circuit can be super essentially can be really small right it can be it can be like log in depth versus oh, okay. for for the other one you you have it's like linear in depth okay thank you and and like the nice thing about the data loaders is that there's in betweens too. So that's the technology, essentially. And and you should uh, remember also that that there's there's a trade off here, right? Like if if you're using a one hot encoding, then you may need more qubits, but you 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 get a, a shorter circuit, which means on a uh, low fidelity near term machine, it might work better. So, you know, there and what Fabio was just saying is that that there there's kind of midpoints between these two. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so so essentially that's that's what power, so what we saw here is like the 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 functions that we have on Forge directly compared to scikit learns, right? We saw k nearest neighbors, k cent, uh, k nearest centroid, and q means, which it compares to k means, of course. And and what's powering those under the hood is you know the the loading part. Of course, those are all simulated right now; they're not on a quantum computer. But uh, the you know the data loaders are the first part of the circuit, and then quantum distance estimation is the second part of the circuit. Um, okay, so now we won't have a demo for this. I just kind of briefly want to mention, since I brought up the Monte Carlo, um, so so on our roadmap is essentially also providing like Monte Carlo functionality, and uh, the the kind of technique we're going to be using this, this isn't published yet, but it's essentially a way to do more shallow uh, versions of Monte Carlo algorithms. There's been a few papers actually, if you follow the uh, if you follow the research here, uh, that first, like first day, like kind of took away the the quantum Fourier transform at the very end. Um, but what we can show is that you can kind of also get a speed up under certain conditions, even by doing fewer uh, kind of fewer calls to the Oracle or fewer Grover calls in the in the Monte Carlo algorithm. So that, that's all I wanted to mention. Uh, so now let's move on to binary optimization. Um, so you know, quantum annealing is one of the one of the main ways, at least in the in, in the NISC era, to do uh, optimization using quantum computers. And of course, annealing is a heuristic. And you know, as the problems get larger and harder to solve, they don't always perform well. So what we've developed actually is kind of a boost to quantum annealing uh, that that improves the performance. So I want to show an example of this. Um, so, so here I'm counting the number of good solutions. Of course, more good solutions is a good thing. Um, of course, and, and I'm, they both had the same number of samples, so that was fixed. Um, and you know, the the orange bar is bare bones D-wave, and the blue bar is essentially using our uh, quantum annealing algorithm on top of D-wave. And of course, for smaller problems, you can see that. There's a slight, it's performed slightly worse than D-Wave, but as the problems get larger and, and actually harder in this case, uh, you can see that uh, using the, this is, this is actually goes by the name of annealed offsets that we developed, and uh, it, it definitely improves the performance by solving these optimization problems on D-Wave. <laughs> uh, so now Natalie will give a demo of this essentially. So we're gonna see D-Wave running on uh, default settings and then with our settings. Let me just add here quickly. Um, uh, you guys, you folks just met Denny, but Denny, I don't know, what, 10 years of D-Wave? Eight. Eight years of D-Wave. So he's you're going up against a guy who knows his stuff when it comes to the D as, as well as other things. So no pressure here. Uh, I should also mention that this presentation was made for like non-experts, as you can see, right? So I mean, we're happy to talk to talk about more about the algorithms as well, right? So so uh, I'm you know the annual offset functionality is provided by D-Wave kind of as a hardware feature, of course, but. Well, the, the, the true algorithm here, what I mean is like, 
it's a heuristic to pick the anneal offset that kind of only depends on one parameter, right? Like as opposed to like optimizing over all of the uh, each qubit that you're using. Anyway, I'll let Natalie do the demo. Um, okay, so you guys are able to see this notebook, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Fabio said, I'm going to highlight some of the advanced functionality of QCWare on D-Wave. So here we have a Q matrix defining the binary optimization problem we want to solve. And um, so D-Wave allows its users to specify all types of parameters and settings. Um, and in this case, we're talking about anneal offsets, which is like uh, sort of a, a period of time you might want to wait before uh, starting your anneal on each individual qubit. Um, and choosing good parameters on D-Wave uh, can be pretty challenging. So when you just use the bare bones D-Wave and just do default standard uh, quantum annealing, it still works. And those were the plots that Fabio showed of just D-Wave. But here at QC where we've developed a heuristic to help find better offsets. Um, and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna compare the two today with this example. Um, so first uh, let's just run standard quantum annealing. Um, and right now we're running this on D-Wave's 2000Q machine. Uh, so as you can see, it got success probability of about 40%. Uh, so now let's try doing this with QCWare's uh, enhanced version where it finds offsets. And as you can see, we only needed to set a single parameter to help find better angles. Um, okay, in this case, it's a uh, 30%, which is actually worse, but I, this is a probabilistic algorithm, so I guess we can, it'll change over time. I can try rerunning the two as well, but um, yeah, in this case, I guess it didn't work. Uh, it okay. doesn't, it, it doesn't, it's not guaranteed performance improvement every time, actually. It depends on the right. problem, too. It just tends to work, um, it, 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 it works well, kind of, most of the time. Right. Yeah, so in this example, not like I just tried the end and it stayed around, it got 35%, but this time QCWare, using QCWare, we got uh, 60%. So uh, yeah, obviously it's a quantum computer, so it's not going to be deterministic. But um, in general, uh, our algorithm uh, has seemed to do much better in a lot of uh, problem instances. So that's all for yeah. quantum annealing. Okay, so I, I've got a couple questions. Yeah. Um, so the, the, first of all, that problem, the test problem, um, it, does it, it, does it come from any particular like graph theory problem or anything, or is it just kind of a random cubo? Yeah, it's from, uh, okay. Maybe Sean might need to help me out with this, but it's what, what does ASC stand for? Alternating sector chain, actually. Alternating. So, uh, alternating sector chain. So uh, it, it, in this case, it's a specific problem. It, the, the, so the, the name of the the name of the problem, like kind of in, in the physics community, is alternating sector chain. Um, but it, it essentially just you know sets the sets the j values to plus or minus one. Um, but specifically, the reason we chose this problem is because uh, there's a paper um, that Juan Adame and Peter McMahon. Uh, wrote a few, a few. Well, I think that it was published even in 2018. Maybe it was 2019. The original archive is much older, but um, I can send you the reference for that. And they studied these problems specifically because, like, there was some motivation, kind of theoretically, that like it, it, it's like natural to set the anneal offsets delta that they, this parameter that we choose in in a particular way. And they like kind of study these problems quite systematically. Um, on D-Wave, and you, you you can like build them naturally on the Chimera graph directly. So you can kind of push the size to be quite large. Um, and by studying these problems, they actually showed that like for these for this collection of problems, the uh, you know a new this a new offset heuristics improves the uh, success probability quite dramatically actually on most instances. So again, there's actually instances where it's slower. Um, you know, it, it, it can it essentially can decrease its success probability by up to a factor of two. 
but in some instances it actually increased the success probability by up to a factor of like over a million i think in there in that case like there are some problems that they were like not able to solve essentially on bare bones d wave settings but using annual offsets they they were able to solve and they compared it to the hfs algorithm uh which at the time was like state of the art for for problems that fit on the chimera graph it can be adapted but anyway like that that's kind of the the study that was done so then actually you know that that's no go ahead sorry yeah so so just a couple follow-ups so that problem that you're solving um there is no uh that's not a logical problem the problem is designed to fit directly on chimera right yeah exactly okay and then so so it's not like every time you're calling uh d-wave uh with your algorithm or the standard algorithm it's not redoing an embedding you're doing a fixed embedding every time you you call it because the problem is already a physical problem yeah that's a good question actually so um in the in the paper yes but in the code that we designed at qcr that's not the case and in fact um so let me actually share my screen again. I know this isn't a very scientific uh, graph any, uh, at all, but this problem, like the data for, that we that we used here, came from uh, came from a not fully connected, but uh, the guy degree like uh, I don't remember the degree actually, but it it was like quite connected in fact. Like the the it, this was a logical problem that we embedded on DWIV, and it, we actually used the same heuristic after embedding and then we did de we, we unembedded using majority vote in this case and this is this is the the results that we got so even though kind of the the paper the science that came behind it was from something that did that was kind of directly native on d wave because you, you could push this further the it we found later this is through a, actually a customer project we found later that the the heuristic works well kind of no matter what Okay, and then my then last question. Um, so the, the so you're actually choosing the anneal offset uh, separately per qubit, and so I guess uh, I guess what I'm kind of curious about is, uh, is I guess two part question. First of all, do you do that sort of in advance with a classical heuristic, or do you actually use the result of annealing to to help you choose uh, the offsets? And then the following part is. Um, do you do you make the set of offsets available to the user, and so the user could store them and then reuse them later if they have to run a similar problem? Um, so so here actually we're choosing. So while it's true that we, of course we, when we send the problem to DOA, we provide one uh, offset per qubit. First to answer your first question, no, it's all done using a classical preprocessing. So the the number that Natalie computed only had like it, it's like one it's like you send it to d-wave once using those parameters the top one is like no annual offsets the bottom one is with annual offsets there's no like back and forth there which is kind of like the highlights like the strength of this heuristic the other thing is like yes we come up with a number per qubit but we don't have to kind of compute we, we don't you know it's not like it, the, the computation is much easier than that because okay. it only it, it secretly only depends on one parameter. It's it's it in the code it was the anneal offset to delta parameter, and then it it like the the like sizes of the chains it, it also like determines exactly what the like what the formula that that is that is used to compute per qubit what the anneal offset is. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Great. Okay. Anyway, so so that was it for uh, the annual offsets. Uh, I'm actually going to to talk about we'll give, we'll give one more demo about QAOA. So you know, on circuit model machines, uh, QAOA is kind of like the what's most talked about for the for the NISC era into solving optimization problems. And as you know, uh, the the QAOA actually requires finding like these angles or parameters. Um, before you, so, so such that when you sample, you'll get good solutions. And that takes quite a while. So what we've developed also is a way to find uh, the optimal angles for a class of QAOAs, P equals one, for those of you who are, who are familiar, um, in a fraction of the time. So Natalie will, will, was gonna demonstrate this functionality again.
Okay, so uh, as Fabio said, I'm going to go over QAOA with depth one. So uh, here is just a four qubit uh, optimization problem that we want to solve. And uh, so there's going to be two parameters that you have to try to tweak to get QAOA to perform well. And choosing these parameters is uh, definitely non-trivial. And so typically when you want to solve these parameters, the most naive way to do this is uh, to just sort of simulate uh, how, these, how these angles would perform and uh, sort of calculate the expectation of the algorithm. Um, and uh, even though this is only a four qubit problem, you can see that it's kind of taking a while. Um, so yeah, here we see that it took about 23 seconds to calculate. And here's a heat map of uh, how the angle's performance. And you can just interpret these blue spots as the angles being good. Um, and as you can also see from this heat map that it's kind of funky and the landscape is not very smooth. So choosing good angles uh, really, really affects the performance of QAOA. So now I'm gonna show uh, a QC words implementation of calculating these same exact values, but uh, it can do it much faster. So here you can see that it took only three seconds to do this, um, which is much faster. And since choosing good angles is really important for the overall success of QAOA, uh, this really speeds up the implementation of the entire process when you're trying to do QAOA. Um, yeah, Does, are there any questions on this? Yeah, and you're you're running this on a simulator, uh, right? That's what you said earlier. Right. So uh, this part up here that took a while is uh, simulating QAOA. Uh, down here, it's actually um, calculating this value analytically. So that's why it's so much faster. And uh, so with the simulator, um, is it a it is is it a simulator that includes noise? Um, and the reason I'm asking is because, you know, some algorithms perform differently when you've got noise included in them. So, oh, but you're you're the, the you're, you said the QC where uh, algorithm is not using a simulator; it's an analytic computation. So the presence of noise is not going to have any impact on on what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And to answer your question about the, the first example where we are using a simulator, uh, it's we're not using one with noise. So that's a good okay. question. And, and in fact, you know, the optimal angles can change. Right. If if you're going to run if, if you're if your question, if your question is like, you know, how would the optimal angles also change if you ran it on a noisy device and that they would be different. Right. So if the noise. I expect some degree of like continuity of like low noise, the angles we find are still good, although I'm not completely sure about that actually. Um, but, uh, but you know, for, we, we do expect that, like the idea is like you run the analytical computation ahead of time and then you just sample using the quantum computer. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, great. So we kind of already discussed this. So the next thing uh, I want to talk about is just the circuit simulation tool, so the expert tools. Uh, this is what it looks like, right? So it's kind of similar to, to, to kind of standard packages that are out there. Um, and, you know, the, here's, here's the list of functions that we provide for circuit simulation. Uh, run state vector and run measurement. Those, you know, state vector simulation gives you a state at the end. Measurement is, you know, samples from that state. Uh, we also provide a poly expectation functionality, which directly computes the expectation value of poly operators. And then uh, also it lets you compute the gradients of those oper of the expectation value of those operators with respect to parameters in your circuit. So th that's kind of the standard functionality that we provide. Uh, we, like I mentioned earlier, you can import those directly from Qiskit and CERC. Um, and then uh, I just want to highlight here that we, you know, I mentioned the GPU simulator. So, so this is kind of a comparison, right? We, if you run it, if you run it on a local CPU, a circuit of 28 qubits and 6,000 gates, it can take up to 10 minutes. On on the GPU we have provisioned for you, it, it takes like about a minute. So there's, you know, a, a quite dramatic 
speed up there. And um, of course, there's many others. Uh, there's there's lots of other packages that you know have GPU simulators in them. But but the what Forge provides in this case is convenience because you don't have to have your own GPU or provision it yourself on the cloud. Like it, you can just log on to Forge, import your circuit, and run it on a GPU. And that's what Sean's gonna demo right now. He's gonna first run a circuit. Well, he's not gonna actually run it because it's gonna take 10 minutes or maybe a little longer. And then he's going to import that into Forge and uh, run that one on Forge. Sorry, I was lost my uh, Zoom screen for a moment there. OK. All right. Um, can you see my, um, my screen here? Mm -hmm. OK. So um, this is not Forge. This is a local Jupyter Notebook on my uh, MacBook Pro, just to give you the, the uh, scale here. Um, and uh, you don't have to follow the code uh, unless you want to. But what I did is I made a circuit using Qiskit. Qiskit is IBM's quantum circuit uh, simulation package, um, <clears throat> their, their circuit editing and simulation package. So. I made a circuit. It has 20 qubits. Uh, it has 984 gates. Um, if you've been doing quantum computing, then you know that once you get into the 20 qubit range, it gets pretty unwieldy. Um, so I simulated the, the, the circuit. It, it's not as long as Fabio indicated. It took 37 seconds to run this circuit. Um, but OK, uh, if I increase the qubits by even one, it would be over a minute, um, and it pretty much increases by a factor of two for every qubit you add. Um, so uh, as you can see, it's, it's pretty um, computationally unwieldy, and you can imagine it getting much worse very easily. So um, I want to show you how you can use uh, a tool like Forge to make this, um, to, to sort of ease this pain. Um, the method is to just see all this code where I wrote the circuit. You just copy and paste it. So here's Forge now. Um, I just copied and pasted all that code into the cell. It's it's the same cell. I don't know. Maybe I commented out a couple things, but other than that, it's the same cell. Um, and in this in this starting cell, um, the only key thing is that I have this line here to tell Forge that I want to use the GPU simulator because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Forge's GPU simulator to uh, make this run faster. Um, so let's let's go ahead and, and run it. Um, it's the same circuit as before, 20 qubits, 984 gates. It took three seconds this time. So um, the point here is that, uh, you know, there's nothing magic about using a GPU to speed up a simulation. Um, but what is nice is that doing that yourself um, is not a very fun process. You have to provision a machine with a GPU. This uses a N NVIDIA V100. Um, it's a pretty expensive uh, uh, machine to provision. Um, you have to write the code. Maybe uh, you know you have to know how to write CUDA and so on. So the 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 sort of convenience here is just that you can just copy and paste the code. Oh, one thing that I forgot to mention that's worth noting is that there is this one line of code right here, which which basically imports the code from Qiskit into uh, Forge's native language for um, quantum circuits. Um, okay, so that that's what I'm going to say about our uh, GPU uh, uh, quantum circuit simulation. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. question. Yeah. And so if you, uh, I think I saw a line of code up near the top of your Jupyter notebook where yeah. you imported this package called uh, Qsetta. Uh, Q oh yeah, yeah. And that, that's yeah. Could you say something about that? You might be able to guess just from the just from the uh, colorful name, but. But Kizeta is a is a package for converting between different languages for editing quantum circuits. So you can use Kizeta to start with a uh, quantum circuit written in Google's Circ and convert it to Qiskit, and then go from Qiskit to Quasar. Quasar is is the one that we developed. Um, one one note about Kizeta, in case you're interested, is that when when we convert between different languages there might be an overall phase applied to the final state vector created by the quantum state. But um, you know, for anyone that, that is familiar with quantum mechanics knows that an overall phase doesn't lead to any um, physically meaningful difference. Thanks. 
Yep. Great. Um, so the last thing I, I guess, uh, want to highlight from Forge are the, like I mentioned, that we, you know, we provision uh, the, a lot of backends for you. So uh, now Natalie is going to show us uh, for running a Kubo, right? So it's an optimization problem, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, just do a classical brute force solve on it. Then uh, we'll do one of the D-Wave backends. Uh, we, we provide access to both Advantage and a 2,000 qubit machine at the moment. Uh, and uh, then run it on QAOA, uh, both simulating it on a CPU, the GPU backend that we said. Um, and then we also provision, we also let you use uh, Amazon Bracket CPU simulator, as well as IonQ and Rigetti. Uh, because of scheduling windows on IonQ and Rigetti, we're not going to actually run it live, but uh, but but we'll see. You know how one would do the, that on Forge, and it schedules it for you. Yes. So here we have a, a Cubo definition that for the problem that we want to solve, um, and it's only on three qubits this time. So. Um, first, uh, I'll show just this brute force solver. So we can specify just to use QCWare CPU, which will do brute force search. And we can see that our solution is 001. Uh, and as you can see, we just make this call to solve binary. Uh, and it is kind of like um, one function that can solve on various backends with various methods. So uh, in each of these, we're just going to be changing this backend string. So now let's try this on a quantum annealer. So now we're using D-Wave Advantage, which is D-Wave's newest quantum annealer. And as you can see, we got the same solution, so that's good. Um, and D-Wave also uh, returns a lot more information, which we can see here by printing the entire response. So now let's try uh, doing QAOA. So again, we can do this with the same salt binary just by changing uh, backends. So now we'll do this on QCUR CPU simulator, uh, which of course gives us the same solution. And uh, like Sean showed earlier, uh, it's similarly easy to use the GPU simulator here. And also as you showed, it can result in very uh, significant speed ups as uh, the circuit size grows. So now I'm going to show the two Amazon bracket backends. Um, and as Bob, Fabio briefly mentioned, they do have scheduling windows. So you can't always get a result back immediately. Um, so for example, right here, I'm going to run it and it will say like I'm outside of a scheduling window because uh, right now we are. Oh, oh OK. Sorry. Okay. Um, here, I'll just take that. One second, sorry. Make sure this doesn't happen uh, during Q2B. Okay, so here we can see that we get an error where it says, uh, Okay, I guess we are in a window. Okay, sorry uh, about this, but uh, yeah. So, so actually, if you uh, the issue I think there is, if you try changing QAOA and measurements to like ten or something, it's just oh. a coincidence that we we do we have yeah, but we we probably won't be able yeah. to run because of the queue. But at least now it, it should submit it. the The problem is is I don't know if you set the timeout either. Right, like it will keep it will keep waiting until, um, un until it runs because we are in this window. Right. Yeah. So it seems that right now we are in a window. Um, but yeah, I guess I should have set a timeout. Um, I guess I'll it just. Will. Oh, okay. It actually ran. There we go. I guess it. Yeah, I guess it ran because you, every other time I've done this demo, we've been outside of a window, so. It just gives a response that says we're outside of the window. But 
we actually got a response here. And here I had sort of like a backup result in case we were outside of the window that I can also show. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so Rigetti returns all this information from the QAOA. And of course we get the same response. Um, so yeah, similar for IonQ, they also have this window. Uh, I didn't. Wow, I'm impressed. The uh, beta and gamma angles that came back from Rigetti look like they're exactly the same as the ones that you got with, with your API to like all the decimal points. Um, no, so that's actually because of how self binary is doing it under the hood. Um, it's not, it, yeah, yeah, that would have been, so, so if you see uh, in the self binary, there's a QAOA optimizer called analytic. Also, it would have, it wouldn't have been that fast. All that was done was uh, we analytically calculated the angles and then submitted one circuit without optimizing the angles on hardware. That's why that was, that was the same. Uh, I must apologize. I have to hop off. I've got another meeting in a minute. I've really, really appreciated this. This was very cool. Um, and I may reach out to you guys later. I captured your email addresses. So thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, no, right. thanks, for, thanks, thanks for joining. For Talk to, nice to meet thanks. you. Thanks, Danny. We'll Bye. see you around. Bye. Bye, Terrell. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Actually, you know, I think we can, we were, we're at the top of the hour, so I guess we should uh, finish. I'm just going to... Uh, uh, I'm just gonna like finish uh, by like mentioning Q to B as well. Uh, do you wanna stop sharing? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So so I just so first of all, I just thanks for listening, right? And you can sign up for a trial. We we provision a trial account. There's plenty of time to test all all the functionality that we just discussed. Uh, but then the final thing I want to mention is that. You know, we host Q to B every year. This year it will be a virtual event. Um, you can there. There's a free there. There will be some free talks as well. But otherwise, you know, if you sign up, you'll have access to to all of the all of the recordings as well. You can go to q 2 bconferencecom and um, and and check it out. And uh, thanks for listening. And also thanks to um, uh, Sean and uh, Natalie for for giving the demo. I guess I just forgot to share my screen, but I, I think I think most people are familiar with Q to B. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Thanks uh, everybody very much. Uh, and I'll shout out to Denny in in since he's not here, but he's asking some mm -hmm. really probing questions, which was really cool. I've mm -hmm. got I've got a, a question, and it's uh, you know let's let's back up and and. Uh, I have more of a forest question ra rather than some of the trees. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one of the things I'm focused in on, uh, besides the technology, I'm, I'm still climbing the curve in the quantum space. Uh, I'm a classical guy for decades. Um, but I've been focused in on workforce development. So, so it's a great opportunity to talk to some people with their hands in the weeds here. Do you see, you know, when it comes to training people, uh, you know, obviously in a workforce, you have different levels of skills. And I would put you guys down at the, the lower level, meaning you're, you know, you got your hands in the weeds there. Uh, but for the vast majority of us, uh, thanks to the work folks like you guys do, guys and gals, of course, uh, and companies like QC Ware do, uh, do you think it it's, conceivable that we'll be in a world where uh, we have a bunch of users really just calling, um, you know, tools like, you know, Forge to do all the dirty work, if you will, of the quantum space. So for example, you know, I want to do a classification problem now. You know, most people, frankly, can use uh, AWS and use some libraries to do a classification task without necessarily knowing all the nuances underneath, thanks to the work that was done at the lower level by many, many developers. 
And, you know, in, in watching your talk here, I'm kind of getting the sense that is there really a need um, for, in large numbers, for folks really understanding even the gate, mo the notion of gate, the gate model, uh, where instead users can take advantage of things like Forge and really never get their hands dirty, if you will, uh, in, 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 in understanding, you know, unitary operations and all that goodness. Do you guys see a world where that might be the case if what I articulated made any sense? Yeah, so I mean, I think that that's kind of what Forge is building towards. Um, now, there's always going to be a need for people to know uh, quantum computing uh, at various levels because we need people to work mm -hmm. on building the tools for for first of all we need you know for scientists that build hardware right um that's not even what QCWare addresses um and then and then you know you need people to build like the control mechanism for the hardware and so on we need people who are you know very good even at classical software to provide a just kind of nice interface to like connect and, and they convert like the signals into like actual like into like actual like data that gets sent back and so on but yeah like you, you definitely are going to need people to design uh better algorithms and this and like actually write the algorithms but for the if you're if you're thinking about just being a user and just extracting the advantage that quantum computers provide then the you know it, i don't see it being necessary to know even what what a qubit is Right, like yeah. I think that that's the level that we're going towards. Uh, we're going towards this even classically, right? It's not a pure quantum phenomenon. Um, I think you know more and more people try to build tools that kind of reach more people with that that need not have the training, kind of to 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 make the same whatever they're making or um, or trying to compute. They 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 don't need to know the underlying algorithm. That, and I, I absolutely think that's what we're going towards. Yeah, you know, and, and I don't know whether it's good or bad, but I'm trying to position training programs and, and things like that for five years down the road. And it's much, you know, in classical terms, I don't know how close you guys are to some of this stuff, but we've, you know, we've got products like WordPress, which don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. I'm not an advocate of that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, you've got people that frankly can't debug an RSS feed using WordPress to pull in RSS feeds, for example, they have no clue really how it works. It either works or it doesn't. And, and so, you know, there's that level of user that, you know, may never need to know what a qubit is. Mm -hmm. uh, just like, you know, I, I, I mean, I technically, I understand it, but you know how GPU refreshes the screen and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I get it, but I don't need to know it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just looks like that's what everybody's building to. That's kind of what you said, Fabio. You know, we, we, we may be um, in the training space, we may be over training people uh, to a large degree. Um, you know, if you're looking five years down the road when, when Forge is a really mature tool with uh, a lot of awesome algorithms built in it, you may not need to, to really care about gates. Thanks to you. Yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead. sorry. I, I was just going to say that that th this this discussion is in, interestingly kind of related to some sorts of like internal conversations that we've had at QCWare. Mm -hmm. You know, one one of the big ones is kind of uh, you know you know how Fabio explained that in Forge we kind of think of it as being divided between um, uh, tools that are meant for people wanting to do applications and um, what we called expert tools. Um, but as you saw, basically meant, you know, circuit editing and then um, accelerating a circuit on a GPU, for example. Um, and, you know, we've had tons of discussions about, you know, uh, uh, what the role is of expert tools in a, in a product like this. Um, our conclusion for now is that because of the, you know, the, the state of the industry right now, the early state of the industry, it, it still really makes sense to you know, give people access to, to um, you know, direct circuit editing and that kind of thing, um, partly because, you know, we're at a phase where, where people want to learn a lot. And, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, people 
have never even heard of quantum computing and, and they, they want to, um, when, when you're first learning something, you always want to start at kind of first principles. Um, but it, as a more kind of long-term view of something like Forge, it's, it's definitely true that this is the type of thing that's more meant um, for high level applications, not low level. Um, overall, it's meant, it's meant to, to make it so that, that you don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to uh, uh, write a amplitude amplification circuit yourself. Um, because yeah. like you say, that, that requires a lot of knowledge and training. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah, we our focus right now, you know, is as an industry, as an ecosystem, is probably appropriately, you know, focused in on error correction and and understanding, uh, you know, how how things work and noise and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, it's it's probably not the end game. The end game is probably where we're going to end up with. I mean, this is an extreme, but it, we could be there like WordPress and all that other nasty stuff, in my opinion, in my opinion. Um, but uh, yeah, just thought I'd pose the question out there. You know, I, you certainly made me start thinking about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, tools like those, those are valuable actually. I mean, I think in general, it's fine for a lot of people to, to use, to, to like kind of make use of a technology, even if they don't know, how to how like under like the underlying way it works like it's kind mm -hmm. of like building an application like it's uh, overall I think it's good that WordPress exists because more people can build websites and you know just the kind of overall improves kind of like communication and you know stream of information and all that um, but the, like the, if you're going to like build like push it further like you kind of do need to know how it works I like to build like truly a non-template based website you're going to need to know more than just wordpress right so yeah. then so kind of there's room for both um and i think like so and then in general right like early on like it tends to be more the experts that are going to use a tool um and and you know then then tools like what forge wants to be kind of come up come along and they address like one segment which like it's still you know no matter what i think even even with the turnkey algorithm implementations, Forge is still kind of an expert tool in the way that like, you need to know that you're solving an optimization problem and you need to know how to be able to get a, the objective function and so on. Um, and that, that's, you know, that, that's not as high level as it could be, right? It kind of, it, it's like abstracting away the quantum, but it's not abstracting away like the mathematical, like classical optimization I, part. So there may yeah. be even tools that just do that. Like, you know, the, there, if you, there's people that like have are solving optimization problems, or th there's something that's being optimized, and they could benefit from it being faster, but like they don't even like quite know how to make it into a, a Kubo, right? That that's what solve binary does. Mm -hmm. So right now it's pretty limited, but but I think there will be like different layers, and like eventually, uh, you know, the 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 technology, or at least part of the advantages provided by the technology will be available to most people kind of, I mean, I'm kind of comparing it to building a website, maybe too extreme, but sure. Like, like, like WordPress makes building a website. Like yeah. that, that I, I do believe that, but, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think that like people who want to extract more out of it will learn more and uh, people who don't have time or don't want to, they can still use it with, within like kind of the tools that are provided. But I guess that, you know, in a way, in, 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 when you're speaking there, you know, I guess really that's my, my question is, do you guys think, do y'all think that we could be, uh, given the work you're doing and others, uh, someday we could be at a, wor at a WordPress model for quantum computing where, you know, um, we people can be productive without knowing anything about unitary operations and things. It sounds like uh, the answer to that may be yes. Well, let let me make a comment about that. So, so I think one of the one of the slight okay. So, so one one question 
there, there's two different sort of notions of quote unquote using quantum computing. Um, one is that you are a developer and you want to put a quantum algorithm as a backend for, I don't know, your, your uh, uh, phone of the future app. Um, the, uh, the other is, is that, is that you're, you're imagining more like, you know, you, you uh, uh, are someone who, who wants to use a quantum algorithm for something where, where that itself is in some sense, the product. Um, but like thinking more of like the, the first case, one, one thing to remember is that um, what we would kind of expect for the usage of quantum algorithms is they're probably not going to be, they're probably not going to be standalone. Um, probably what, what we're going to be looking at um, once, once hardware really, um, really becomes sophisticated and the algorithms become equally sophisticated is that, uh, is that um, it's going to kind of be like, there will be classical algorithms that, that call quantum uh, computers as, as, you know, intermediate steps. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think it's very likely that there will be certain, um, you know, certain interfaces for certain applications where it will be known that, okay, there's, there's a, a way to use quantum computing as an intermediate step for this particular application, and it, it gives a nice speed up, you know, just to make something up. Let's, let's say that it's discovered that, that there's a way to more efficiently render uh, like um, uh, uh, ray tracing for, for computer graphics. Um, then we can definitely imagine that there will be, um, you know, uh, WordPress type things, or maybe I should, should say like Unreal Engine type things that would, that would, you know, completely hide all of those details. But then some developer who, who just wants to make some animation uh, can just like click a drop box and then a little drop down box and click uh, quantum. Uh, and then, and then, so there's no reason that that could not could not uh, be a thing. That's that's a sort of long term vision, but 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 um, there there's could definitely that that could definitely be the case. Well, cool, cool. Well, it looks like you guys are, as you said, driving towards that, which uh, I think is great. Okay, um, Andre, you've been here the whole time. Uh, Dave, Henry, any questions from any of you? Please. Uh, yeah, I have oh, a quick cool. question. Um, so back at the beginning of the talk, there was a code sample that was shown, and it was uh, in reference to 40, uh, like a Hamiltonian, and I think uh, 40 something or others with two futures. That's all I ever remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, can you go a little bit more in detail about the Hamiltonian exactly? Like, if I could see the code sample again, I'm wondering. Actually, that, um, that wasn't the Hamiltonian. Actually. That wasn't that, the Hamiltonian. That, you know, no. So actually, all that I what what that was 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 um, forty. That was literally just forty data points. It it was just forty ordered pairs of of real numbers. That that was all right. it was. Um. Uh, uh. And what I was doing there was I was running clustering algorithms on those forty data points. Um, so I, I ran um, uh, some supervised and unsupervised um, clustering algorithms on those data points. Um, there, there was nothing that I showed that explicitly used a Hamiltonian because all of the um, all of the steps in the um, quantum circuits at play um, and the corresponding Hamiltonian for the time evolution in those circuits that that was all hidden and 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 not explicitly shown in the code. It was you know, all of the quantum steps in that code were um, hidden behind calls to Forge's API. So in that case, the the call to Forge was calling a function called fit and predict, which uses our um, QML functionality. And that, that sends a request to our server. Um, and and then the um, all of the details about the quantum computation are actually done on the server side. So it's not exposed to the user actually. Okay. And I guess a follow-up question uh, to what to your discussion that you you were having: um, mm -hmm. How can somebody who's who's trying to learn more about um, quantum computing, like programming, um, or like I'm kind of interested in the financial aspects, like uh, 
how it could be applied to trading or um, like market structures and that type of thing. Maybe Fabio so, would have some insight on that. Uh, but do, do you mean like, how do you learn more about it or like? How, yeah, like what would you say is the fastest way? Because right now I'm just, <laughs> I'm using a, a book and like reading out of a book, but I'm having trouble uh, kind of like applying it to the domain that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so, okay. Part of the problem, uh, part of the problem is that of course, nothing that you're going to do on quantum today is going to like give you a performance advantage over what you would do over the best, best classical thing you would do. Right. So, so that's some, a caveat to start with. Right. But so then, so then, um, uh, the, the question is like, I guess like you probably want to learn what algorithms are promising, um, in finance, right? What, what quantum mm -hmm. algorithms are promising in finance? Um, it, you know, there's no like book or tool that's like read, like out of the box. I mean, Kiskit has a bunch of like pre-built algorithms that you can play around with. So that will give you some practical sense of how how you would probably apply it. Um, yeah. But then uh, there's actually papers out that are like reviews of quantum computing. There, okay, there's very, very high level papers like BCG reports on like applications of quantum computers and finance, but they don't have any technical detail. And then mm -hmm. there's, um, there's, uh, th there's like more technical papers by people at IBM. And actually I'll, I'll like, give a shout out to a few people at QCWare who are going to be releasing a paper on the archive in the next few days, I think. The, the plan was submitted by tomorrow, so we'll see. So maybe next week, um, you can, you can look, we'll put it up on our website. You can look on our website. It will be more technical, but essentially like what quantum algorithms can provide in finance. It's just a review paper, um, mm -hmm. but it does address some of those questions. And I know IBM released a similar paper like that. It talks about optimization, like with application, like portfolio optimization, for example, uh, Monte Carlo is the, the other. Main. So the, the two main algorithms that are discussed in that context are just optimization algorithms then if in the clear application there is like portfolio optimization like mm -hmm. picking a set of assets that you know minimizes risk for example and then yeah. another one is just monte carlo for like pricing derivatives and then but okay. then there's like all machine learning algorithms might be useful right who knows right all right yeah. i appreciate the answer yeah, Dave. Sorry, there's there, there, there's no single path for climbing this mount this cur this mountain. Um, right. And I bet you, if you talk to everybody, every every person has a different pathway that they've taken. You most of the these three guests here. I think you're all from Berkeley. Yeah, actually, I think we all the um, three of you. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. well, one <laughs> one clear path is head to Ber Berkeley because uh, it right. clearly produces some good output. Uh, but uh, do, do you know the Quantum Palooza website, Dave? If I may. Yep. Yeah. yeah okay. I, uh, so, I've been on there before. Yeah. So one quick hit is uh, click the 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 button up at the top that says Past Events, and do do a a, a Chrome search on finance, uh, finance, and and you know I, I learn better when people tell me stuff. Uh, so that that might be a good because a good way to uh, start to get a sense of the finance um, uh, events out there, and many of them have recordings available. Uh, because definitely, I would say, in my experience, uh, you know, just having a single book on quantum computing is not going to do the trick. <laughs> right. Um, I've got a whole library full of them now, and each one has their benefits. So there's no there's no single path to take it's just feel around and explore yeah that's pretty much kind of like what i've been doing i actually have been attending uh these like quantum palooza events uh oh, cool. through, like throughout the lockdown period so um yeah it's been it's been fun to keep up with that and i've been trying to keep up with as as many as possible to do with the uh the finance uh side of things yeah there's an increasing amount of I'm seeing, uh, you, I don't know if you guys uh, see other stuff, but uh, I'm seeing, you know, quite a bit in finance and optimization of late over the past two months. Uh, there's a lot of papers coming out uh, and talks related to them. So, uh, yeah, there's no, no single way to climb this mountain. Mm -hmm. But that makes it interesting as far as I'm concerned. 
So, And a related interesting thing is that we still don't really know what the, like, we really do not know what the first genuine application of quantum computing will be. When, when I say genuine, I mean the first application that quantum computing will give a, a real speed up for like a, a quantum supremacy type speed up and such that the application has has some form of, of value to society or yeah. commercially. So mm -hmm. we, we, ju we just don't know it. So no one knows if it's gonna be finance, if, we're, if it's gonna be a chemistry simulation yeah. So every, everyone's <laughs> on in the dark. <laughs> but that's okay. That makes Finally. it fun, man. Less boring. Yeah. If we all knew the path, it would we wouldn't be here. Anyway. Okay. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time, y'all, out there on the West Coast. It's, uh, it's goodness, it's 930 your time almost. Um, Dave and, and, and Andre, thanks for stopping in today. We've got uh, a number of people out there on YouTube as well, so on the YouTube stream. So thanks for dropping in. Um, Natalie, Sean, and Fabio, thank you very much. Appreciate you taking the time for this. I hope uh, you got uh, a good dry run in. I think uh, it'd be a good presentation, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, Q2B. Dave and Andre. Uh, Andre. Yeah, I'll be um, attending. Oh, cool. Sweet. And I heard, I heard music to my ears. It sounded like there might be a few free talks. So that means I can put it on uh, Q to, on the uh, Quantum Palooza website since they're free, some of the talks. I'll watch out for those. So um, yeah, cool. So. Yeah. Right. If they're there, I'll, having... I'll advertise them. So thanks again. Yeah. Uh, say, say hello to everybody back at QC Wear for us. And, and thanks again for making the time and sharing your knowledge here. Really appreciate Great. it. Thanks yeah, so much thank for, yeah. for joining. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you. See ya, Dave.